from tonight's lecture. Um, SFAA would appreciate any donation you might wish to make. There's a little little collection box just outside the door here, and it will help us with lectures and outreach, and we appreciate it very much. I want to tell you about the coming lectures. <coughs> March, we're having a man named Simon Beerer. He's with Copley Institute of Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford. His title is Probing Fundamental Risk Physics with Strong Gravitational Lensing. Many useful results for cosmology have come from this phenomena. Dr. Beerer will shed more light on how astronomers are utilizing strong gravitational lensing to probe the nature of dark matter and dark energy, the dominant yet unknown components of the universe. That's on March 18. On April 15th, tax day, hope you'll all come. <laughs> Um, why do galaxies die? How Silicon Valley spectral revolution will solve a hundred year old mystery. This is given by Kevin Bundy, assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz. He'll be coming a distance from UC Santa Cruz on, on a busy night. Over a hundred years ago, Edwin Hubble noticed two distinct classes of galaxies. Youthful spirals with smooth and smooth and faded ellipticals that were red and dead. The MANGA Manga survey is mapping 10,000 nearby galaxies to help understand how all types of galaxies in the universe, in, in the galaxies formed, and the early <coughs> in the early universe, and the spectral revolution going on in Silicon Valley with nanotech and photonics will help transform astronomy instruments in the future. April, March, and April. Tonight's presentation by Dr. Jeffrey Moore. He's a research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. He's an imaging team lead for NASA's New Horizons mission to the Jupiter system, the Pluto system, and the Kuiper belt. Additionally, Dr. Moore provides leadership and participation on the NASA planetary mission science teams and has led multiple Mars-related NASA-funded investigations. His extensive research focuses on a range of topics related to the geological evolution of planetary landscapes. He's published a number of papers on stratigraphy, geomorphology, and sedimentology, and he's explored the roles of impact cratering, volcanology, and tectonism on terrestrial planets as well as the outer planets. Dr. Moore is a recipient of the 2018 G. K. Gilbert Award for his outstanding contributions in the field of planetary geology and was recently awarded the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. He is also a fellow of the Geological Society of America. Um, tonight he'll talk about the Kuiper Belt object, Aerokoth, and the encounter. It explores the historic voyage of the spacecraft, which has served as an ambassador to the planetary frontier, and it sheds light on new kinds of worlds and on the outskirts of the solar system. Dr. Moore will discuss New Horizons' flight above the surface of Pluto and its encounter with a cold, classical Kuiper Belt object, or KBO, Erekoff, and will explain how this encounter has provided a look back into the beginning of our solar system. Join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Moore. Mission began on the 19th of January 2006. 
It was launched in what was then the largest available uh, rocket that was available in the uh, American rocket inventory. Uh, this is an Atlas V, uh, normally used to loft uh, school bus size uh, communication satellites into geosynchronous orbit, but instead we launched a much, much smaller object about the size of a baby grand piano, which is more or less a hood ornament here in the nose. And so for most of you know the momentum equation where you can trade velocity for mass, um, or, uh, and so as a consequence, by having a, mo a very low mass uh, uh, spacecraft, you have a very high velocity. So, let me actually go back. I'll go back to the slide. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry. <coughs> there we go. So, to finish the story about the, the launch, so that we, we were the fastest object to, uh, man-made object to live, leave the uh, uh, Earth's orbit. Uh, we crossed the orbit of the moon in uh, 10 hours. The, in, with that perspective, that took three days for the astronauts to get to the moon. Uh, and we had an encounter a year later with uh, Jupiter and then uh, an encounter with Pluto nine years later. And then three years after that, we had the MU69 or uh, Arakop encounter on January the 1st of 2019. So let's talk a little bit about our spacecraft. Now, I'm a geologist, so these things swap and pet through their fields and particles instruments, and I don't even pretend to have any idea what they do. So. <laughs> but I, I do know what the other instruments do. Uh, the ALICE instrument is a UV spectrometer. Uh, RALPH is an instrument that shares a common set of optics but has two different detectors. One is a uh, wide-angle, medium-resolution color camera, and we'll see some pictures from that. Uh, and the other is the spectrometer, which is an imaging spectrometer, which we use to uh, try to determine the composition of our targets. And then we have LORI, which is basically a, uh, to first order, an, an eight-inch Smith Cassegrain. It's not strictly a Smith Cassegrain, but, but that's it. For those of you who have, you know, Celestron or MEET uh, eight-inch telescopes, that's basically what it is, and we use it for our narrow-angle, uh, high-resolution images. Okay, so as I said, we launched on January uh, 2006. We passed the Jupiter system exactly one year later. Uh, we took some great pictures, including a beautiful picture of a huge fire fountain erupting uh, off the north polar region of Jupiter's volcanic moon Io, which you can find on the internet, and I invite you to enjoy that spectacular picture. And then we began the long cruise out to Pluto. We flew past Pluto on Bastille Day of 2015, and then they say on New Year's Day of last year, we encountered Arakov. Now, as I said, I'm not going to really belabor the results from our encounter with uh, the Pluto system, but as you can see, Pluto turned out to be an astoundingly uh, complex and beautiful object that uh, showed a, a, a diversity of geological processes and materials present and operating on the surface, which left everybody uh, blown away. We, of course, all speculated on what we might see uh, on the team before we got there, but none of us really anticipated it being as amazing as, as it turned out to be. And, Pluto also has a moon that's relatively large compared to the size of Pluto. And so the Pluto Charon system really is more like a double planet than a planet with a moon. And Charon itself turns out to also be a really interesting uh, little world, especially for its size. And then there were four smaller satellites, all of which were discovered after the spacecraft had launched towards Pluto. And so we had to actually reprogram the encounter to get pictures of uh, these other objects. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, the extended mission was to fly past uh, Arakatha, which is embedded in what you might describe as the third zone of the solar system, or the inner zone of the solar system, or the four uh, terrestrial planets, you know, uh, Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury, and here's the asteroid belt that separates the inner planets from the outer planets, which are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, which are all uh, gas or are gaseous worlds, which themselves are surrounded by planets or planet-sized moons, uh, such as I hear we refer to the volcanic moon Io uh, and orbits uh, Jupiter, and then on to the, the third zone of the solar system, of which uh, Pluto is the largest known object in the, the, the so-called third zone of the solar system. And yet, Arakoth is representative of a, uh, a typical member of this population. Uh, it's called a cold classical uh, uh, Belt object because you can tell from its orbital dynamics that it's never been uh, disturbed since it formed. So uh, we thought before we got there it would represent uh, the landscape or the, the, the processes or the materials that uh, 
formed immediately up at the dawn of the so uh, solar system history, and, and we presumed that probably nothing would have changed since its formation. And to that end, we were very pleased to see that's exactly what we found. Okay, so here it describes these various families. So uh, this shows the inclination of the orbits of Kuiper Belt objects. Inclination is how far they tipped away from the plane in which most of the planets occur, which is, for many of you know, known as the ecliptic. Uh, and then there's the issue of uh, uh, so-called semi-major axis, which means what's the average distance from the sun. And so this population of cold, classical Kuiper Belt objects is just this little pool here. And so many of the other objects which are in the Kuiper Belt probably have had more dynamic history. They might have spent time closer to the sun. They may not be good representatives of the primordial material, which makes up uh, our solar system. And of course, uh, because of the dynamics in the Kuiper Belt, some of these objects eventually get scattered towards the sun and became, become comets, like, for instance, Comet CG, which was studied by the European Rosetta mission over the last several years. <laughs> yes? What do you mean by hot classical? I, know, I can understand cold out there. Okay, so I should have, and then, by the way, if I use a term which you want to ask me about, just interrupt me. Although, otherwise, please save your questions because I may answer them in the process. But yes, yeah, a hot classical object is something which we think originated in the cold classical. And you, cold, you think I'm talking about it being chilly, as in low temperature. But no, this is a term that dynamicists use, uh, and the dynamicist uses the term cold to mean that. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of perturbance or disturbance, in it. and hot is used by a dynamicist to mean things which have been perturbed or scattered or had things done to them. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I'm with you as a geologist. Hot means like it will burn me if I put my hand on it. Cold means it will make me cold. But uh, dynamicists live in their own little world. I'm sure you've had plenty of them come out and talk to you before, so you can enjoy them in their own little world uh, <laughs> later. Oh, wait, let's go back to. I was going to make a point with this. Okay, so first of all, to fly past Carl Kipp was quite a challenge compared to the flyby we did of, of Pluto in 2015. The target was 80 times smaller in diameter than Pluto. It, we, so we flew four times closer to get some better pictures. But this required far more navigational precision. And I will bring to your attention, we didn't even discover Carl uh, Kipp until 2014, and we couldn't discover it until we finally got permission to use the Hubble Space Telescope to find it. So in a very short period of time, we found it, we determined its orbital uh, characteristics well enough to fly to it, and we were continuously refining the uh, navigational information about uh, Arrokov so that we could actually fly onto the target. And let me say, by the way, uh, we hit it spot on. There was the highest resolution images you will see the size of the object versus the width of the frame were almost exactly the same size. So it had been even off by 10 kilometers over a distance of, you know, uh, 5 billion kilometers away, we would have clipped the uh, target one way or the other. So we, we hit it within a kilometer or two of its actual location. Something, I remind you, that is a billion miles further from uh, the sun than Pluto that wasn't discovered until the spacecraft was almost at Pluto. So uh, hats off to the navigation team. In fact, I also, people often ask me what made uh, New Horizons a success. I said, well, two things. First and foremost, it's a triumph of the engineers. Because without them, there's a million things that can go wrong. And usually only one or two things that can go right to make a successful mission. And fortunately, both Pluto and Aerocop were ready for their close-ups. So <laughs> the combination of those two things is what made it such a spectacular and pleasant experience to be involved. So going on that list, we, uh, as I said, we didn't know, we didn't know where it was uh, uh, precisely until those who came up on it. Uh, we didn't know it might have rings or, or debris or extra moons and things we could fly into, which we had to make a very careful study as we approached Aerocop to make sure the environment was safe to fly through. We even had emergency backup abort trajectories that you could radio up to the spacecraft at the last minute to still collect data at a safer distance. We discovered there had been rings or something. Uh, our, uh, we use uh, plutonium as a heat source, and the heat is converted into electricity using thermocouples, but the plutonium slowly decays, as radioactive material does, and so we had less uh, spacecraft power when we flew past Aerocop than we did when we flew past the Pluto system. Uh, and then, of course, last but not least, there has to be a lot of autonomy on board the spacecraft because if there's a problem, there's almost a half a day at 12.25 hour round trip light time to 
here there's a problem and, and figure out something and send back a, a fix. So the spacecraft's kind of on its own when it gets out to these sorts of distances from, the, from us. Now the black by sequence was also really challenging. Uh, we flew past the encounter was 14.4 kilometers a second. Our distance from the sun was 43.23 AU. I think most people in this room know AU is what AU is. There's a mean distance between the Earth and the sun. Uh, so we're over 43, 43 times further from the sun than we are right now. Um, we uh, have picked a, a close approach distance of, of, uh, of about 3,500 kilometers, which is about four times closer or three times closer than our closest approach of Pluto. Uh, so you say, oh, well, you must have seen it four, three or four times better, but we begin to have issues of, of both smear and also the low light levels meant that uh, it was hard to shutter. So we, we picked this distance as the closest distance you could fly to it and still take a sharp picture. And we'll see some examples of that in a moment. And here you can see, and here's uh, the distance in miles. We sh I wish I'd put this in, in units of, of minutes. So from here, here it's about well, there we go, 15 minute time tick. So you can see there in the two hours of, of closest approach, all of course, which took place completely autonomously on the spacecraft. There was no way we could control it. So we radioed uh, the counter up to the spacecraft and hoped for the best. We got the answer like a day later. <laughs> and here you can see here our best infrared, best thermal, all the different observations we have to make. And I'll show you many examples of that as we proceed in this talk. So let's talk about what we saw. So the first image uh, of Arakov that was taken like only two days before the encounter to show you how little we knew looked like this is a raw image and processed it looked like this. So we knew it was oblong. And that was interesting because we were trying to see a light curve of Arakov as we approached it and it never got brighter or darker as we got closer and closer. So people were wondering, is it circular, is it spherical? Uh, you know, why don't we see a, uh, a light curve? So then it was puzzling, sort of shocking to see that it was it was oblong. And here we are, like I say, a day and a half before closest approach, and, uh, and 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 so to give you a general sense of size, it's about 30 kilometers across. And in this particular image, the pixel size is about uh, 5.8 uh, kilometers or miles, I guess. 9.4. So it's so it's only three pixels across at, at this point. I, about putting things in miles and kilometers, which you just go to the metric system, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so this shows what happens at just in one day observation. So, so uh, the next day, you can see it looked definitely by low weight. Uh, and we, you know, the image now uh, is maybe uh, 10 or 15 pixels across. We now have a real size for it, about 33 kilometers or around 20 miles. And then the day of the encounter, we got about 15 hours after the closest approach, you got this image. So again, you can see it's uh, definitely by low bait. It looks, you know, like you know what it looks like, right? It looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so our initial perception was it was basically two roughly spherical bodies stuck together. And of course, that was the first indication we're dealing with true classical planetesimal. The, the basic building blocks which form everything else in the solar system. Uh, and as I will uh, uh, discuss in this uh, presentation, there is reason why this is a, a unique sort of structure that which can only really both indicate that it was formed uh, as one of the very first objects made and tells us in fact about how these primordial building blocks were made. So uh, here's the highest resolution of, um, uh, highest resolution MVIC image. MVIC is the color uh, uh, wide angle camera, which takes pictures at about four times lower resolution than our highest resolution camera. But it also has better signal to noise, which means that uh, while the pixel scale may be a little coarser, the quality of the, the grayscale depth is greater. And so, you know, here was the best use uh, of Arrowcop. It was taken seven minutes before closest approach. It suggests it was the merger of two uh, yet more primordial planetesimals, and we convenience <coughs> called the small lobe, the small lobe, the large lobe, the large lobe. And I have to tell you a story that until uh, a few months ago, we called this object Ultima Thule, so we named one of the lobes Ultima, the other lobe Thule, which was an easier way to think about them. But since Ultima Thule has gone by the wayside, uh, we're going to name them small lobe and large lobe. So <laughs> please, please. Uh, uh, 
Okay, so here is, first of all, you determine the, the uh, rotation. And as you can see from this rotation, as you as suppose the spacecraft approaches the target, this also explains why you didn't see a light curve, why it wasn't getting brighter and darker as we got closer because the spin axis of the lows is basically more or less pointing back at the spacecraft. So there was never a time in which uh, there was an end and then a, a, side, a side view, so it was just doing this, like a pinwheel in front of us. There was no light curve. And here's another cool version. In this case, you'll watch, you'll watch the object uh, uh, change in appearance as we get closer and closer, but it's been derotated. And here's the view that we saw as we came up on it. And, and so those of you who are wondering about the size of, of uh, Aerocop, watch closely what happens as this image in particular uh, uh, evolves. Now, can you tell this is actually not really spherical, but it's kind of pancake shaped? <coughs> it took a long time to figure that out, but within a few days we realized that's what was going on. This smaller lobe is more, more uh, rounded than the big lobe. The big lobe really looks like a, a fat hamburger patty. <laughs> and here's a stereo view that we made basically by taking the, the two best images and then interpolating between the two of them. And so that gives you a sense of, of the general uh, appearance of the object. As you can see, as you get to the higher resolution image, you begin to see the smaller craters, which uh, fade out as you uh, go back to the lower resolution image. And so to put things in perspective, these craters like that one, for instance, or maybe that one, are about the size of a football field for scale. And for those of you who can do cross-site stereo, there's a good stereo for you. So <laughs> I can do it, but I, I'm not sure, of course, the population in back can do it. There's plenty of examples of stereo versions of this uh, on our website, which you can get to by typing in New Horizons uh, and APL or New Horizons and Aerocop. Uh, and no one less than Brian May, the, the guitarist of uh, Queen, has gotten involved with our mission and, and came to our encounter. And, uh, and is a quite the uh, stereo viewer aficionado, and he's produced any number of stereo views which are available to the public. And I invite you to download your, your stereo views from him and, and, uh, and enjoy it in 3D. Now, here's the latest and greatest shape as we published recently in the magazine Science. And here you get a, a good idea of, uh, of here's sort of the fatter, more, I mean, more round, less, less flattened. Small lobe, but here's the you know the more flat large lobe, and these uh, uh, wrinkly looking things here are attempts to uh, derive the actual uh, local ups and downs on Ultimatua. I'm not sure you call it that anymore on Aerotip, um, uh, where we tried to map those onto onto the, the, the spherical shapes which we derive by more typical astronomical means. Okay, now this is a slightly older version, but still kind of a neat. Graphic, so I included this. It. it takes a while to start, but you see it's a little flatter than it really is, but that still gives you a sense of, of what's going on with it. A little, a little more cute. Okay. Uh, and now, as you've already surmised, there is definitely a difference between the small lobe and the large lobe. Right? Here's a uh, geological map that was done by Oliver White, the speaker that you had a couple of months ago to talk about Pluto. He's a member of my energy team. Uh, so he and I and a number of people sat down and uh, decided what we thought were the geological provinces of uh, Arrow Pith. And here's the map that Oliver made for that, which was, as I say, published in the, in the uh, uh, Journal of Science. Uh, and clearly you can see there's uh, a lot of things that seem to be going on with the uh, lower, the smaller lobe, that, uh, and the, whereas the larger lobes seem to be planar and, uh, and have less different kinds of uh, things happening on the surface. But let's explore that a little. Okay, the first thing we did was count craters and pits. Uh, and if you count all the little pits, of which many may not even be impacts, they might be due to other processes, you still have a ridiculously small number of impact features striking uh, Arrow Kip. And so this tells us two things. First of all, it means that the environment in which 
our uh, resides, this cold classical Kuiper Belt, basically has very little stuff in it. They, 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 they have literally set out there since the dawn of solar system history and have almost no impacts. The only really significant impact feature, of course, is this, uh, this large depression here, which you uh, nicknamed uh, Maryland. So we'll talk about Maryland in a little bit. But otherwise, we, all these other things. So this Maryland is you know, a few kilometers across, and everything else is maybe most of a kilometer across, and there's just very few of them. <clears throat> Both indicated there just, just isn't a lot of stuff out there, and also that uh, the cold classical carbon belt represents basically primordial material. Uh, and this apparent falsity uh, uh, of craters is, uh, can be directly compared to inner slope system objects. So here's uh, Mars is moving Phobos. And by the way, we took pains to take this Phobos image uh, and process it. We degraded it, changed the signal to noise, smeared it slightly, and so on. So had uh, New Horizons flown at the same distance past Phobos, and Phobos had been out where uh, Arokov is, this is the image you would have gotten back. So if, if Arokov looks smooth uh, and even maybe kind of out of focus, that's just the way it really is. Because here you can see uh, an image of Phobos that has exactly the same, synthesized to the same uh, quality as, as Arokov, obviously has lots of small craters on it, and it's a much lumpier, more cratered object. Uh, so it's a good direct comparison to inner solar system objects and, and outer solar system objects. Uh, and for instance, you'll notice a lot of interesting things going on in the outer solar system, inner solar system objects, like you know, the, um, the bright rim uh, of this large uh, crater on Phobos called Spikmi. And in contrast, while there certainly is stuff going on uh, around Maryland, uh, it, it, it is not only is the rim not bright, it's actually sort of dark. And by the way, there's the actual rim of light there. Not this dark stuff here, which is actually kind of uh, a lower, lower of the material that's less bright. Lower up, you know, fancy word for it. Okay, and uh, you think maybe the reason why the uh, smaller lobe on our pit is so interesting is because there's the role of collisions and uh, tectonics caused by collisions uh, on the smaller lobe. So, for instance, there's these plateau units which look a little bit like. Uh, what you might get if you go out and uh, drop a, um, a watermelon, you know, the, the rind will break open and puff open. And so we think that, along with these, these uh, grooves or fractures here, they all had formed uh, either by the impact that formed uh, the, the Maryland impact feature, or alternatively, uh, that when the two uh, lobes came together and merged, that they put stress on the smaller lobe to cause these sorts of deformations. And it's interesting when you look at the steep regions uh, uh, along the neck where the two lobes come together, that we think that there has to be at least some mechanical strength to, to hold uh, them together, not causing it to totally collapse. And so we think that means that the, the body at least has to have the mechanical strength of fresh snow. Otherwise, it would collapse and simply fall inward on itself and just form a big ball. So the strength would certainly be stronger than, than fresh snow, but it has to at least have that value. Uh, and uh, somebody asked me earlier about whether there was uh, erosion on an airless body. And a lot of uh, bodies in the solar system uh, undergo a form of erosion. It's called sublimation erosion. Sublimation simply means that we have ice that directly evaporates uh, into a gas. And the best example we know over here on the Earth is dry ice. You said dry ice, that doesn't melt, it evaporates. So we think that, um, that these scar features, and you can see these arrows pointing at the uh, may be. Uh, scars. You can't quite tell us near the limit of resolution, uh, and it's shown here in, in this uh, illustration, as well as this uh, uh, surface here, which you can tell from some of our steering imaging is also a plateau that stands high. So we, this is the impression this bright material set the setting down basically in a local valley, for lack of a like term, it's called DM here on the, on the geological map. And we think that maybe this is an example where, where the scars are retreated where uh, some uh, very volatile ice once existed in the scar faces, which have sublimated and caused the scarps to retreat. Now, you can ask yourselves what kinds of ices those could be. Uh, they could be things like a solid nitrogen or solid methane uh, or solid carbon monoxide. They probably are not solid water or, sor or, or solid carbon dioxide because they would basically be uh, uh, rocks at, the, at these temperatures. 
and to give you an example of what these sorts of scarf retreats look like, here's an example of so-called Swiss cheese terrain on the South Pole of Mars, which is where the uh, seasonal uh, carbon dioxide frost deposit uh, evaporates away and uh, sublimates away in the spring, forming uh, this Swiss cheese. So in this picture, the sun's coming from kind of from the upper left down to the lower right. So, so that's an impression. That's an impression. That's a, a sun-facing scar. And so you can compare this sort of texture with this sort of pattern and see that why we think that this might be evidence for, for scarf retreat. And also, this kind of scarf retreat, and in fact is scarf retreat, is still putatively identified, uh, also may suggest that uh, the individual lobes are layered like, uh, uh, like onions. So this onion layering, uh, we've seen this before uh, in, in smaller objects, if you think of the hair belt like comets, but if that's indeed what it is, it also suggests the large much larger type of objects are also layered uh, like onions, and that's telling us something about how they themselves form, the individual lobes. And there's also bright deposits uh, in, uh, in depressions at the base of scarves, and we made it of the two possible explanations for that. One possibility is that it's a downslope movement where uh, this is a, a map or a model done by my colleague or my Gorman, who I think may be invited to speak here uh, next year on uh, processes involving how things like this form. Uh, and uh, if you calculate what you think the local gravity is, local gravity would have most things falling down off either lobe and collecting around the neck. So maybe this bright neck feature is uh, it's just material that's rolling essentially locally downhill and collecting uh, at the uh, uh, junction between the two lobes. And you also you see uh, local patches like right here, where it looks like the local depressions also have bright stuff. But an alternative explanation uh, developed by my colleague James Key at Caltech is that this is also the coldest places over a, a year on a year on our a year on our is like you know over uh, 300 Earth years, um, and um, and so it may also just be some kind of weird local uh, ball toy, some sort of frost. Methane frost or something that collects uh, 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 in this region is kind of a, a local cold spot. And we haven't been able to differentiate between those two, although I can tell you, and I'll get to this later, we haven't seen any chemical evidence uh, for any particular ice that, uh, associated with, with, the, with the, uh, the neck. We see evidence for aligned pits, you can see here, and we think it might have uh, formed as collapsed pits under a, a fissure, perhaps. Uh, and some of those, like such as these, can seem to have little uh, bright streaks emanating from them, and so there might have been a little bit of outgassing uh, uh, associated with perhaps the assembly of it looks like those individual little lobes, like and kind of came together to form the larger lobe. Uh, and if that's in fact how this was formed, then that might produce enough gentle energy to not only cause uh, collapse fits to form at the seams, but also uh, light outgassing, if that's a possibility. Uh, and as I just was mentioning in the previous slide, uh, the discreetly bordered similar sized low mounds of a large lobe, we have obviously asked ourselves, uh, are these smaller intermediate sized kind of festivals and the final flattening and collapsing of a swarm that came together to, to form them? Uh, we considered an alternative explanation that may be uh, a very short-lived uh, radioactive element known as aluminum 26 might have driven convection in some low temperature ice. That was a cool idea. We uh, did the calculations and realized it wasn't realistic for, uh, with realistic parameters, but at least we get people call it try, right? Um, and then they just go the process. Usually you can't, uh, when you see something truly bizarre like this, most of the explanations you have for it are going to certainly turn out to be wrong. So it was an important and humbling thing to, to, to bear in mind when you uh, look at uh, uh, objects in, in the universe. Okay, uh, our cat turns out to be really dark. Uh, this is a normal reflectance. Well, uh, if something is perfectly reflective, like uh, a perfectly reflective mirror, it would have a value of one. If it was completely black, like the model of the 2000 the Space Odyssey, we have a value of zero. So uh, typically, um, charcoal has a value around 0.15-ish to 1.1. 1 .1. So uh, uh, our cup is a very black object. Uh, and 
most of the objects in the uh, cold classical hyperbola are dark. Uh, and um, that makes the course even more challenging for us to find them and fly by them and detect them and, and, uh, and, and study them. Again, our instruments uh, were losing power and, uh, and were built towards the limit of detectability for something this dark. It was a challenge to produce the images I've been showing you this evening given its, its darkness. Also, it's uh, uh, really red. Uh, it would look like a, a, it was made of chocolate, as you can see it outside a spacecraft uh, through a, a window. But its neck is less red. And, uh, I was raised in Oklahoma, so I am something of an expert on red necks. So, <laughs> uh, so therefore, we can clearly say that uh, it does have a less red neck. Uh, and, and how this image was produced was we took, this is the, our highest resolution color image we took with the color, um, last color picture we could take with the color camera. And here is the image that we took later with our higher resolution black and white camera. We simply merged these two to give this impression. There are, there are better versions of that, I think, actually, this evening. Uh, now, what really puzzled us is what is it made of? And, um, there are a lot of things people thought it might be made of, uh, but we really couldn't ever detect unambiguously anything other than frozen methanol, which is rubbing alcohol, it's the stuff they tell you don't drink, it will cause you to go blind. Um, so we, that was the one positive uh, discovery we found on it. Methanol is a material which even though obviously evaporates freely off your hands when you use it. Uh, here on the Earth uh, is uh, forms a solid rock, which is uh, 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 immune to evaporation at the at the distances that uh, uh, our own is from the sun. We also, for a variety of reasons, think there's uh, uh, probably water ice. Uh, there's a possible detection of water ice, but the spectroscopers are really <coughs> caught with it. They're really seeing that. And uh, it's, I said there's a possible detection. Well, that, uh, since this slide was made, they, they feel more confident that there's indeed uh, uh, methanol ice. Uh, but they do believe that the red color is probably due to the radiation processing of methane. It turns out that methane, when you expose it to uh, uh, solar radiation, UV radiation, cosmic rays, uh, is fully converted into uh, larger uh, carbon hydrogen chains that makes basically uh, uh, hydrocarbons. And these hydrocarbons, as they grow from simple methane ice to more complex ices like ethane and propane and benzene and all these more elaborate ices, turn dark and red. So most likely the explanation uh, for what A was originally made of and why it has the color it has today is because of methane. Methane is expected to be widely common in the outer solar system. We saw uh, whole uh, giant fields of, of methane spires uh, on the tops of uh, ridges on uh, Pluto. So uh, methane is a, a perfectly viable candidate and may well be the major now semi-indetectable uh, constituents of, uh, of Arokov. Okay, now how we got more information on the uh, uh, shape and size of Arokov is we actually, after we flew past it, we immediately turned back around to look at it as it passed before our field of view, we got this series of images. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was using, adding those to the images we took during the closest approach, they were able to actually get its, its, its shape, including a fairly competent about its three-dimensional shape, which, uh, which we've been talking about. Uh, and so here's a, a montage uh, of uh, images taken from uh, 9.5 hours to closest approach. And so you can see how quickly it got big. This is in contrast to the, uh, the, the Pluto encounter, where we looked at Pluto and, and, and studied it in, in fairly significant detail for almost the entire Pluto daily rotation, which is about six and a half Earth days. Uh, but of course, Pluto is, like I said, you know, uh, much, much larger than, uh, uh, than Arrokoth. And so uh, while you can sort of watch it you know, majestically get larger and larger and larger as you flew past it uh, during the Pluto encounter, this thing was like, you know, uh, the insect that strikes the windshield as you're driving down the freeways. It's not there, it's not there, it's not there, and zoom, you're gone. <laughs> Uh, but we're still continuing to, to uh, uh, play back more data. Uh, we still have about another 20, minutes to all, uh, 20 months to get all the data back down to the Earth. Here's, here's one of the, uh, the rooms at, uh, at the Applied Laboratory where we collect the data. Uh, let's 
little bit about how this feature forms. So uh, it is a binary. If you think about it, uh, um, that's a rather unusual shape to see in, in space. It's a, it's a very delicate structure. So it begs the question, how does it form? Uh, first of all, you have to ask yourself the question, how fast can two things come together and not destroy themselves? So a series of uh, uh, numerical models uh, done by Richardson and Moronic uh, looked at two spheres. These are spheres, because it's easy to model spheres and pancakes. Um, uh, to see how fast and what angles <coughs> they can come together. Give a drink of water. And still, you know, survive as a, as a uh, uh, two two recognizable sphere. So here's ten uh, meters a second. And here's five meters a second. This is a seventy-five degree glancing collision. This is a forty-five degree less glancing collision. Let's watch what happens. Well, the answer is it just be a, a car sideswipe. You know, you'd be a bender bender. You call the cops for this one. <laughs> Here is a more substantial collision, but in this case, it's a little more like a, a, a head-on or a semi-head-on, which uh, the object is substantially deformed, but they don't really resemble each other after they uh, crash into each other. So had, uh, had the, the two lobes come together at these sorts of velocities, you probably would not see the nicely uh, preserved lobes that we, we, uh, we see in the case of Perokop. So we did a number of other tests, and you really had to get down to speeds of around 2.9 meters a second to uh, keep the lobes from basically uh, deforming each other. So how fast is 2.9 meters per second? That's the speed that if I were to stand off of the stage and jump on the ground, I would hit the ground about 2.9 meters per second. So it gives you an idea of how slowly these things came together. They, they came together at a speed that most of us in this room could easily jump off the stage and, and, and comfortably walk away from. And that's a sobering experience, a sobering bit of knowledge to know that that, uh, that the uh, a merger of these things take place at such an incredibly uh, uh, low uh, relative <laughs> velocity. Now, how do these things form? We think in general, we think that there's a they begin as a swarm of much smaller objects of some indeterminately small size, maybe a few uh, tens of uh, uh, centimeters or a, a meter across, and uh, basically, this clot of material basically collapses in on itself, uh, and you have just these, these swarms of particles now uh, spinning around mutually, uh, uh, spinning around each other's mutual gravity field. And you can see how, in this kind of a uh, simulation, you can see how you might see the emergence of you know, outer satellites remaining bound, short-lived pairs eventually coming together, and many, many other particles escaping. And I'll, I'll run that again. That's it's kind of cool. So I can do this now. Presentation, yeah. Sorry about the JPEG artifacts, but. So, the original swarm of flying snowballs that came together to make what well, is a aerocom, probably, we think, more of a longer process, similar to this, involving gravitational collapse. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, are several other explanations for how things finally came together. We think that. As you saw in the previous uh, uh, model, like they're rotating about a small icy bodies that start to collapse in their own gravity, coalesce to form larger body, bodies. And then we think eventually one possibility is that the last of the big bodies that have formed are slowly uh, come together as they should, let's call it angular momentum. And they get angular momentum by ejecting smaller objects. So maybe one of the reasons why Ferrokov doesn't have any moons is that the few remaining objects that were orbiting the, the two last big lobes were ejected by the two lobes and in the process stole the momentum from them and caused them to come together. And so we eventually end up with the object we, we see today in this illustration. Uh, there's another hypothesis called gas drag. And I think this is the one that's most popular of all the cool kids at school. And, <laughs> and this is an idea that uh, that very early in solar system history, there is basically uh, a nuclear wind, which is basically just gas in the, in the nuclear disk. And as uh, objects, still the, the last two big objects for the original collapsing cloud, are rotating around each other, rotating around each other, that as they move into uh, this nuclear wind, 
that the gas drag essentially robs uh, angular momentum uh, between the two objects and eventually causes them to dock together. And this process, according to models, uh, suggests that they can put together an object like, like uh, Perlkopf on time scales of one to two million years. And we think that uh, gas drag is surprisingly effective at I need to use another buzzword that that was just like hardening, hardening cold classical hyperbolic bi binaries, but hardening is just again a word that dynamics is like you use to say it makes them come together and stick. Uh, the suggestion that process is fairly common is when we examine um, the uh, comets in the flowing past. Uh, here is a series of comets in the flowing past in the, uh, and we see that many of them in fact look like they're made originally of two lobes which have subsequently been eroded away by the loss of ice as they fly near the sun. Although also clearly there are at least a couple of examples of cometary nuclei which don't exhibit these properties. Although you could imagine they might have started off with by a little uh, low bay and one of the lobes was lost. But clearly there's enough of these things around to suggest this is not uncommon uh, amongst the uh, hyperbolic objects. And indeed uh, looking at light curves of hyperbolic objects suggests that many of them are in fact binary, and at least uh, a non-trivial portion of them are contact binaries like uh, like Karakov. So the extended mission continues. Uh, we are looking to find another uh, Kuiper Belt uh, uh, target. We, we have enough power to last until the mid 2030s, and we'll be at that point approaching 100 times further from the sun than we currently are right here. Uh, because what we think is the structure of the Kuiper Belt, we think our best chances for finding more Kuiper Belt objects for a variety of reasons be in the next couple of years. So we're intensely searching both of our spacecraft and very large telescopes, mostly in South America, to see if we can find yet another flyby target. So keep your fingers crossed. If you find another one, you can invite me back. We'll see if it's any different than the Aerocop. So I'll leave you with the, with the thought that you should think of the New Horizons mission as a time machine that has transported us to the very beginning of solar system history and to a place where we can observe the primordial building blocks of the planets. So at this point, I'll end my formal lecture and take questions.
Well, actually, it's more brown than purple. Uh, I, most methane, when you first freeze it and then subject it to radiation, will turn basically brown. Uh, now, I know it's confusing because a lot of times when people are producing color images of uh, planetary objects, they uh, will uh, enhance the color to help recognize differences between different places. So you use different colors to see different regions. But that, as a consequence, causes the colors to not really be the natural color. So, uh, so probably, if you were flying past MD-69 yourself in your spaceship and looked through the, the, the window at the target, it, it would look, if you had, if it, was, if it was a bright day or you had really sensitive eyes, it would be um, that shade of brown. As I said, it's actually pretty dark, so it'd be kind of dark brown, like a Hershey bar. Sure, my pleasure. I'll, hold, let me, I'll get back to you, but let me take this first question. Uh, you mentioned sublimation. Uh, how does that work in a no atmosphere scenario? Well, uh, sublimation works very well in an uh, atmosphere scenario. In fact, uh, the absence of an atmosphere uh, enhances the sublimation rate. But if you have sublimation taking place in an atmosphere, there's competition between how fast uh, the molecules subliming off the surface can uh, diffuse into the atmosphere. Uh, and and the atmosphere itself. So uh, atmospheres actually suppress the sublimation rate. Now, yes, yes, ma'am. Um, so the sublimation rate is the same for the sublimation rate of the planet. Well, Pluto is a planet. Uh, it's technically referred to as a dwarf planet, but you know, just as dwarf people are still people, dwarf <laughs> planets are still planets. <laughs> <laughs>
object the solar system, unlike anything you've seen elsewhere, anywhere in the solar system. Uh, fortunately, the uh, uh, part of the sky where future targets may be found, the star fields are thinning out, and so we hope that with ground-based observations, we can find, hopefully, at least one more target we can fly by. Sir. Well, what would you estimate the uh, chances of uh, New Horizons being able to be successfully uh, targeted on another object? Well, probably, if you believe the models, it's only going to be maybe 10%. 10%? Yeah, it's the sad truth. Now, of course, we're going to regions we don't know anything about, so you know we're kind of speculating based upon extrapolation, and extrapolation has been wrong in the past. So um, we're hoping for the best, and we're going to give our college try and see if we can find another target, but we may not. Sir, the, um, I don't know if we talked about it or not. I didn't catch it if we did, but the faint circle on the large low, is that a remnant of a crater, or uh, maybe it's a crop circle? <laughs> <laughs> When you say uh, uh, you can observe the uh, we can observe the primordial building blocks of the planets, um, I don't understand what that means uh, at all. Do you mean that an object like this one is kind of like a rolling stone that gathers moss and gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes a, a planet or, or a large object? Or are you yes. saying that that these uh, that these objects collide with each other and then kind of stick to each other? But we actually, you're anticipating the question you should be asking my colleague, Orkan Umara, who I think will be invited to speak sometime next year. That's exactly what he does. Uh, he's a dynamicist uh, and a, uh, a guy who specializes in planet decimals, whereas I'm a geologist. So, you know, I'm one I'm who asks, you know, is it, is it done yet? If it's out of the oven, I'll take a look at it. It's still in the oven, it's like, oh, it's, it's still cooking. Um, but yes, that's exactly what they mean by primordial blocks. I think it's, that it, it's from things like this that uh, other things fell into the inner solar system or were formed in the inner solar system uh, or combinations of things formed in the inner solar system out of uh, stuff that's not as, as volatile. Uh, then augmented with things falling into the outer solar system which are volatile to bring volatiles to what would grow from small objects into big objects to be planets like the Earth. And we do know that, for instance, due towards the final phases of the formation of instance, the Earth, the primordial Earth had a collision with an object the size of the, of the present day Mars, which in turn formed uh, the Earth and the Moon system. Uh, so there was obviously a, a, ser a whole series of, of either uh, conglomerations or agglomerations early in the game, and that those larger blocks you know, in combinations of either crashing into each other and splitting off, or else crashing into each other and growing that finally formed the planets, we think the original stuff that came in uh, after this, that dance of the dust I showed you in the, in the earlier uh, computer simulation, that after the dance of the dust, you ended up with these things. And they were probably existing within a million or two million years after the sun turned off. So they represent the oldest still existing thing from the beginning of the formation of the solar system. So the things that came before this, we don't have examples of we have these things as, the, as the basically the Rosetta Stone for the, for the rest of the solar system. And, and then how you get from that to the Earth, talk to Orcon when he comes out next year. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. You talked about um, by, about um, comets having that structure. Well, I've read about asteroids that have that structure too that look like two bodies that like stuck together. Yes, there are some examples of that and they, um, the best known one's Hector, which is uh, an uh, uh, asteroid which uh, orbits in the same orbit as uh, Jupiter, but it's out. It was called the Lagrange point, which is about you know, uh, fifth distance ahead of or behind uh, Jupiter. And there's actually a mission called the Lucy mission, which is going to fly and examine these uh, uh, Trojan asteroids, is what they're called, 
and people think that the Trojan asteroids, in fact, are comets which came into the inner solar system and, and were perturbed by Jupiter's gigantic gravity and basically got stuck in a permanent holding position in the so-called Lagrange point. So the fact that you see a few of these shapes in the amongst the Trojan asteroids may in fact mainly because you're simply collecting more things like Ultima Tulane. So if you, uh, sorry, Aerotop. Not Ultima Tulane over here, so I just remind myself something called Aerotop. So if that's the case, if Hector turns out to be a bigger version of Aeropop, then it means these things can grow to quite a size. Now, if we do fly to Hector, and it is a, 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 a cometary object, it came from the Kuiper Belt, because it's so much closer to the sun, you'll see a lot of these erosional processes caused by sublimation of ices. And so we'll have a very you know, extreme exotic landscape of, of steep cliffs and retreating scarps and fissures and all kinds of interesting erosional textures on the surface because you took the stuff that easily voltizes as you move towards the sun and you now move it towards the sun. Yes, ma'am. Oh, speaking of exotic, why is the area on the small globe called Maryland? <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't have an official name yet and so there was uh, a strong predisposition by uh, the, our team to name things after the state in which the New Horizon spacecraft was uh, built and operated. So, uh, uh, so uh, Aerokop is the name of the, is the word for sky from a Native American uh, peoples who lived in what is today the uh, region of Maryland. Uh, and we named the features uh, on uh, Aerokop after the various states. Uh, so there's a Nebraska and Oklahoma and Kansas, things like that. Some parts of it, there were informal names just so we could refer to various parts of the uh, the object, but the uh, the but the large uh, pressure, which I think is a large impact crater, the only large impact crater, was called Merrill. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So where is the spacecraft right now? Is it in the Kuiper Belt or? It's passing through the Kuiper Belt. It's on its way. Up. In fact, it's now already traveled um, about three astronomical units beyond uh, uh, where it was when these images were taken. So to put that in perspective. It's, Travel uh, three fifths of the distance from the sun to Jupiter just in uh, in one year. So it, it it had to go fast to get out there. Otherwise, uh, um, I would have even been older than I already am. <laughs> <laughs> so you're suggesting that it's not dense enough with objects that it will. You have to. You know how they show. No, no. I, I, I wish it was. It'd make our job a lot easier. I mean, at some point would be bad. You you run into. Um, an object and then you'd be out of business. Uh, and uh, the way these, this satellite, the spacecraft works, it records the data and then ra uh, radios it back months later so you can't wreck the spacecraft during the encounter. It's a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it has, as they say, not been a problem. In fact, okay. just the opposite problem. Mm -hmm. Sir? Is it hibernating right now like it did before it got to Pluto? Well, well it's largely hibernating uh, because we have very, well, the, the Deep Space Network is working on its antennas, and so uh, we are more comfortable having it hibernate if we can stay in passive communication with it. But because we're working on the biggest antennas, uh, we are uh, not taking chances or not hibernating it as thoroughly as we usually do to make sure we're having good communication with the spacecraft. So we're keeping what's called three-axis stabilization, which allows us to, to have a better data rate uh, down to the ground uh, using the smaller antennas. But normally you can hibernate it. Sir? How much power does the power source provide at this point? Right now about 150 watts. So if you think of how much, uh, 100, if you put uh, three uh, 60 watt bulbs in a fixture, you are now burning more electricity than we need to run the entire spacecraft. <laughs> and when the, and when, the energy, when the energy source was fresh, from uh, the factory and, and launched off the surface of the Earth, it only produced about 200 watts. So everything you've seen here has been brought to you by spacecraft trans uh, using 200 watts of energy and transmitting across billions of miles of space. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Uh, do we have an idea for the size distribution of hyperbolic objects? Is it possible that there are objects that are close to the size of Pluto? Uh, we've 
There is, in fact, at least one other object we know that's almost the size of Pluto called Eris, which is much further away from the sun than Pluto is. And it may be uh, more massive than Pluto. It has probably does a higher density. But with respect to its diameter, it's uh, about 100 kilometers uh, smaller in diameter than Pluto. Uh, but more typically, the so-called uh, Kuiper Belt planets, or dwarf planets, have sizes that are more like uh, Charon, the uh, moon of Pluto, they're more typically a thousand kilometers across, and there's maybe a dozen we know that are of, of that size, and there's probably several dozen or maybe even hundreds of them that, uh, in the paper that we simply haven't discovered yet. And it's not inconceivable that we'll find, you know, eventually maybe hundreds of, uh, of AU away from the uh, sun, uh, you know, objects larger than, uh, than Pluto, but we haven't seen them yet. Yes, sir. Do you think there's a planet nine? Uh, <laughs> sure, it's Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so a colleague uh, at uh, Caltech, uh, Mike Brown, has hypothesized there might be an uh, object with the mass of either Jupiter or Uranus that's hundreds of AU away. Uh, and he and his colleagues think that the evidence for that is the perturbations of some of the other Kuiper Belt objects. And knowing Mike, I used to assume he'd already found it. He was just leading us on by announcing that he was looking for it. And then Mike, <laughs> <laughs> make a, make a big announcement he discovered it a year later. But it hasn't been discovered for yet. It makes me wonder that, in fact, uh, uh, if it really is out there. there. There may be other processes which uh, perturb these objects, or maybe there's something passed near the sun sometime in the past that might have perturbed these things. Who knows what the real explanation is. So, but they haven't found uh, Mike's Planet X yet, but the, the, we do look for it, um, and it'd be cool if it's out there, so we'll stay tuned. We want to thank you so much.